<clears throat> Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. This is episode number 167, Uno Sesiete. Welcome back, hombres. Welcome back, chicos y chicas. It's me again. <laughs> like, like that little bilingual thing I gave you there, no? You like that, huh? You like that bit of Spanish I gave you? In case you're wondering what language that was, it was actually Spanish. Um, <laughs> hope you guys are doing well. Oops, bit of love of myself. Hope you guys are doing well and really fine and stuff and well hydrated, well rested. I am fresh out of the shower, um, fresh back from a run, um, fresh post breakfast and ready to crack on in and give you guys a little um, short podcast episode before I zip off to work. Um, today was meant to be a little bit of a, it's hard because I try to schedule in my time in the morning, right, to do this sort of stuff. Um, but I ended up coming back a little bit late and, you know, just a general malarkey, but Life is all about the fine margins, isn't it? It's all about the flipping fine margins. I was meant to go run at 6 a.m. Then by the time I came back, I would have been able to shower, wash, change, whatever, and then make an hour-long podcast. But instead, I left the house at half six, which then brought every, which then kind of, you know, gave me a little half an hour delay and everything that I do. So, you know, um, if you're one of those people out there that think, so oh, it doesn't really matter what time you do something, you're wrong, okay? You're absolutely wrong. It really does matter how, how long you do something. It matters when you decide to do it too. And if you decide on a time and you commit to it, try and do everything in your power to kind of honor it. And this is what I'm currently um, trying to do now at the moment. But hey, you know what? Don't want to lose the momentum of uploading all the time. So here I am talking. Um, what have I done today? Oh, yes. I went for a run, a little three mile run, a little 5K uh, around the area today. It's raining and it's windy. So it's probably the worst conditions to run in the morning. Um, you just, you know, it takes you a while for your body to kind of warm up and to get kind of going. Even if you decide to warm up prior to going for a run, it just takes a while to get your, you know, the blood thrown all over your, all around you. And plus the wind's blowing you back and it's wet and you're stepping in puddles and shit that you don't see. Blah, 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 blah. Same old issues. But, you know, we are in London. I've been here for most of my life. So I should not be surprised. Nothing should be surprised in that regard. But anyway, um, instead of rabbing on about what I've been up to and because we're short on time, let's dive on deep to the topics that I have listed here and talk about some things that we saw on the flipping interwebs. Ooh, number one, right? Um, have you seen the have you seen the trailer for uh the R. Kelly documentary? So R. Kelly's meant to be um no sorry documentary R. Kelly interview. I think he's having an interview with I'm, I'm gonna say Good Morning America again. That lady gets all the fucking good interviews, isn't it? She got Juicy Smollett. She got the um the police officer after they we found out he was allegedly lying. Um, so now um R. Kelly is now trying to kind of fight his case. Um, which is strange to me, right? Because I don't know, it seems like he's bang for rights. Again, I'm not somebody, I think the power of the documentaries has got a bit OTT, especially with a Michael Jackson documentary coming out now, um, digging up, um, John Wayne's old, um, interviews from Playboy in the seventies, where he sounds like some guy that was born in the 1940s. I'm sure people were, were surprised by that. I think when people aren't around to defend themselves, it can get a bit dicey with documentaries, right? You're not really sure what the truth is. Like making a murder is a good example, right? You're not really sure where the truth is and where the lies are. Um, of course, with the R. Kelly thing, um, these were allegations that were pinned against him, you know, a while back, I think maybe a decade ago, and somehow he managed to um, he, he managed to fight them in court, and essentially he was found no guilty um, or acquitted. But ever since then, you know, the rumors haven't kind of ceased. We heard girls going, you know, allegedly being abducted or kind of abducted or kept against their will in some sort of weird cult thing where there were maybe uh, a, another le another advanced level of a groupie. And just always seemed like he had like a weird, a bit of a weird aura around him. Plus, I don't think he's ever he's ever helped himself either. He's never really come out and re and really fought his case. Um, he's kind of always kind of um, or maybe it's just because he can't really say nothing that's going to help him. Really, he never really seemed. Like, I don't know for somebody that's meant to be innocent, he never really came across like somebody that was trying to clear his name or was trying to do better. Um, again. I don't know how you can do better with those kind of allegations, but you would assume if you if if you were if you had the feeling that people within your community felt you were some sort of pariah, you try your best to kind of you know um what what you call it you try your best to uh, reassure them that you weren't, but he he didn't really do that. Anyway, um, long story short, now you know he's being charged with I don't know numerous account counts of sexual assault. And it seems like when with the, with the documentary coming out with some of his family members deciding to turn on him with his closest families, you know, he's a strange wife and his daughter as well saying that he's a bad dude. 
you get the feeling that you know it's only a matter of time before he eventually gets um, put in jail. But he's actually fighting his case. He's talking, and he's um I think he's doing an interview with CBS with um what's her name? Uh oh, uh Gail King. That's um Oprah Winfrey's best friend, right? So I saw this trailer, and I'm like, Jesus Christ, this guy actually gonna try to fight it. So here's a little bit of the trailer of him trying to fight his case, and it doesn't sound convincing. If you've ever if you've ever watched those guys on YouTube who talk about um how you can tell someone's lying. One thing I remember them mentioning, especially during the time of the whole Joseph Smollett thing, is that when some someone you know someone's lying when they keep telling you, you know I'm telling the truth. Like when they um when they gesticulate about how preposterous it is, whatever you're accusing them is. When someone's telling the truth, they'll just try and state the truth, right? They'll try and repeat the truth over and over again. But when they're trying to like, you know, deflect and say, Oh my god, you know I you know I'd never do something like that. You know that's not me. Right kind of stuff. That is a one of a key sign of someone's lying. Um and again, this interview probably I don't know how people are gonna interpret it, people are probably gonna start analyze it more than I am. But let's just fast forward a little bit of it here and um here we go. Right, let's go there. They are still talking about you with underage girls. Do you still sit here and say you have never been with underage girls? Can you really say that? I sit here and say this. I had. <laughs> that's that's your first red flag, right? They're saying you've been with underage girls. Can you sit here and tell me you haven't been with underage girls at casino? Yes. Right? I wouldn't even let her finish the sentence. Yes. I have not been with any underage girls. Right? You'd fight your case. When you start saying, let me tell you something, right? It's like, what the fuck? It's, it's like his interview with Tori. When they asked him about um, teenage girls, and he's like, um, "What do you define as teenage?" And it's like, "What? What do you mean? What define as teenage?" <laughs> that is the most red flaggy answer you could ever hear. But again, who knows? Two cases back then that I said in the beginning of the interview that I would not talk about because of my ongoing case now. Okay. Right? Okay. okay. Fair enough. But okay. I will tell you this. People are going back to my past, okay? That's exactly what they're doing. They're going back to the past, and they're trying to add all of this stuff now to that, to make all of the stuff that's going on now. So essentially, he's trying to say that he might have done it in the past, but he's not doing it now. And what they're trying to do is that they're trying to get the girls that are accusing him nowadays, since, I don't know, let's say the mid, I don't know, 2005 onwards, and they're trying to add it to the cases that he was accused of previously. Which is a weird argument to make, isn't it? But, I don't know. Maybe he generally thinks he's not guilty. Maybe he's generally going to sit there. But then it's very rare to get somebody who's, um, let's say, yeah, it's very, I don't know, it's, it's probably very rare that a sexual, you know, somebody that's, into, somebody that's into teenage girls at that time would suddenly grow out of it or suddenly stop. It doesn't really happen, does it? It's, um... I wouldn't assume it does, right? That 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 um that lusting, that um desire would carry on some way, shape, or form in your later years. You wouldn't necessarily just stop. Oh, also, I'm going to stop t touching t teenage girls now because people are saying I'm a I, I, I'm a creep. Um, you wouldn't necessarily do. I don't know. I don't really think that necessarily happened. But that's his. I guess that's his. That's the only thing he can do because you know. Again, like it's fucking nuts that he's trying to defend himself, but you have to have sympathy for him in that regard because. He's really fighting for his life. Like, if he does go, if he if he does get found guilty this time around, he is done. Like done, done. Right? He'll have to maybe sign on to the flipping um sex offenders register. He'll probably be sent to a particular prison full of mad creepos, which then is gonna mess with his psyche if it's not already messed already. The industry will definitely one hundred percent blackball him from then on onwards. Because I think nowadays, I think there is probably some people in the industry that are probably still holding out hope that he isn't found guilty again so that they can put his music back online and stuff whatever because you know this is industry, especially the music industry they has no they have no fucking scruples um if he's not found guilty in a court of law they're going to probably hide behind that and just put his music up again available for streaming right because they can obviously earn a lot of money from his back catalog and i'm sure he would also want to start touring again and earning money in his regard because you know he wasn't able to post that 1 million 1 million dollar bond so um there was a lot riding on this a lot feels real to people but the past is relevant with you with underage girls absolutely no it's not why because for one i beat my case when you beat something you, you quit. beat it you were quick we can't double jeopardy me like <sighs> okay man anyway i don't know i can't handle this anymore 
I guess, look, man, he has to fight for his life and his life is on the line. Um, maybe he's finally realizing the severity of what he actually done. Um, he might honestly think he's not guilty. Um, I don't know. I can't just take the word completely of the documentary, but it doesn't really paint him in a good way. He looks fucking wild in that documentary from the things you hear of people that are the closest and nearest were nearest and closest to him. Um, but again, we will have to wait and see what happens um, as the case um, rolls on. But yeah, okay, he's trying to fight his case, man. I guess let's see what happens with that one. Uh, number two, where we got the uh, da, 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 da. oh, Kylie Jenner balling out of control. So, um, Forbes put together a list of their billionaires, right? B the billionaires of 2019, and um, one thing that's quite evident looking at the list is that it's quite white, right? Um, for the most part, now, most of the wealth is in the hands of very few, as I'm thinking most of us are aware of, right? Um, but there's also a list of kind of the youngest self-made billionaires, right? The ones that are coming up and sort of like, you know, making it on their own. And Kylie Jenner is being profiled as one of them. And the funny thing I think about this is like when I went online and checked about, you know, what people are talking about this issue, the first thing that people scoff about is the idea that she's self-made, right? Like, ah, she's not self-made. She comes from the Jenner clan, Kardashian clan. They have money coming out their nose and ears. But you also have to remember that they've uh, they've only started getting money themselves as a family, right? Since the reality TV days, right? Um, uh, Rob or is it Rob, Bob Kardashian? I'm the lawyer for OJ, right? Who, who passed away a while ago? Um, they had obviously they had they did come from some money, but the ex the kind of you know the dizzying heights of wealth they've been able to amass has been kind of during the whole um keeping up with the Kardashian era, um. um reality tv programs they've been doing and products they've been pushing and all that sort of stuff and um it is quite admirable to think of it that the youngest member the of, of the kind of you know of the girls that we're aware of is the one that's kind of the most um successful in terms of self-made billionaire especially considering how much money her family has and i equate it in the same vein to the donald trump thing i know donald trump isn't probably the most you know liked person in the world he doesn't really get any sympathy from anyone but the idea that he was able to take a one million dollar loan however small or big you may think it is and flip it and turn it into whatever he's turned it into is quite amazing there are you only you only have to look at instagram accounts like the rich kids of instagram to see kids who are just like blowing their month their parents um trust fund or their parents inheritance away on frivolous items on lavish lifestyles without really contributing anything to the world right um, and again, I don't begrudge them because if you know if you have parents who are able to um, provide you with a lifestyle that that means that you don't have to work, you don't have to do anything, and you're a young kid and you don't want to do anything, and you just want to like enjoy yourself. We only have one life to live. Then fair enough, in, do, do what you got to do. But for the kids out there who are risking their reputation, risking money, um, risking time, um, what resources, whatever it may be, in order to kind of put a product out there and have it work. I think that's amazing because you have to also imagine if Kylie Jenner puts out a makeup line, puts out a um, cosmetic line, wherever it may be, and it doesn't work out, imagine the amount of hate that she would get online. Imagine the amount of vitriol, the amount of sniping that would happen online if her products were just sitting on the shelves on her website, not selling, not moving. She slashed the prices again and again and again and no one was fucking giving a shit. All the beauty bloggers who are fucking savage, right? The mute, the makeup bloggers, um, the makeup bloggers on YouTube, they don't cut, they don't um, they for the most of them, they're not really on the whole payola thing, right? A lot of the industry, especially on the review side of it, it's kind of centered around the idea of being objective, which is fucking awesome to be honest, right? Considering in other in other areas of the fucking creative or entertainment industry, there's a lot of payola going on. A lot of these makeup bloggers are adamant or they kind of um, are very stringent on the fact that they buy the item themselves. Sometimes they buy it with other credit cards. They send it to other addresses. They use pseudonyms, whatever it may be. And they and they um, review the products critically because, you know, at the end of the day, you're in the makeup, in the beauty industry, I'd imagine, your reputation is the only thing you have to really re rely on, right? That and obviously the work that you do. So if Kylie Jenner's stuff wasn't good, those people would be the first people to say it, right? But whenever you watch reviews, they're always kind of complimenting her packaging, the quality of her products. So obviously it's really, really good. And again, like I said, I think she doesn't need to do any of this, right? She could just sit on Instagram, post pictures of her body and shit, smile and stuff, hold some flat tummy tea, and she'd ride off to the sunset with, you know, more money than most of most people would make at that age. 
but she decided to kind of go for it and decided to make her, you know, Kylie or Lionel or whatever. Was it actually called? Is it called Kylie Lionel or Kylie Cosmetic? Whatever it's fucking called, it doesn't really matter. But the interesting part of it that I find interesting on here was uh, this bit about, um, let me find it here. Da, 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 da. This bit here, which I found the most interesting. Let me get it up on here. Ba, 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 ba. Da, 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 da. For time. Yeah, so um, the Kylie got cosmetics um, with Jenna started in 2015 um, is its uh, minuscule overhead and the outsized profits that go straight into Jenna's pockets. That's an amazing line, right? Because that shows you um, just how cool it is or just how um, revolutionary it is to start a business nowadays, right? Especially in the direct-to-consumer era. You can essentially make more money now because your overheads are far less, right? Um, in terms of hosting, in terms of servers, in terms of distribution, in terms of payment processing, in terms of delivery, whatever it may be, it's it, all those things that can be outsourced and you can essentially run an entire business on the back of a laptop. And it continues. Um, her empire consists um, just seven of just seven full-time and five part-time employees, right? Running the entire thing. Um, manufacturing and packaging is outsourced to Seed Beauty, a private label put producer in nearby Oxnard, California that also does um, Kim Kardashian stuff. Uh, sales and fulfillment are fulfilled by an online merchant, Shopify, which is fucking awesome, right? And her shrewd mother, Kris Jenner, uh, takes care of finance and PR in exchange of 10% management fee uh, she siphons from all her kids. Fucking awesome, right? So you keep, you keep all the finance and the PR within the family with your mum. You can always trust your mum. Your all your production is outsourced for the most part. Um, manufacturing is outsourced. Sorry, the paying process is handled through Shopify, and you have five full time staff that just on call just to make sure things are going okay, and part time people just to cover the hours that they're not doing. Boom, done. And then and then you wonder why there's so much money to be made off that. And if you see how much actually um it it costs to actually make a, a bit of makeup as well, even like a bit of some a, a stick of lipstick and stuff, the margins are fucking insane. But they only work because her product's good. So I think this is another good example for kids coming up of just what's possible if you want to graft and if you want to put the work in. Again, she obviously has an advantage from some kids coming up. Yes, I'm pretty sure of that. But I think for the in the in the current scheme of things, considering the amount of you know um, questionable role models we have nowadays in social media landscape, I think Kai Jen is not too bad, man, for for girls and boys or whatever um, growing up now on the internet uh, to see somebody that's really done it the right way. Um, again, like I said, she doesn't need to do this. She could just ride off into the sunset with on the back of her um her, her family's fortunes and pop up here and there on keeping up the Kardashians. But instead, she's kind of paved the way her own way. All the marketing and all that kind of stuff promotion she does basically through her own instagram account instagram stories sometimes through snapchat it's fucking incredible man. i'm a big fan of it i recommend you check it out it's a really good um detailed um kind of article no sorry it's a really detailed feature on billionaires all around the world and it's a really good snapshot on basically what she's doing um it's on uh forbes it's on forbes.com for has billionaires but i'll link to the uh, to the kylie jenner thing in the show notes for you to check out um next up on here Da, 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 da. Uh, what do we have him oh michael jackson documentary okay so the michael jackson ne leaving neverland documentary is, is out at the moment isn't it right and everyone's sort of talking about it and we're in this current state where everyone's trying to say can you separate the artist from the art um and personally i think no man I, i'm a, always i've been a big 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 michael jackson fan from when I was um, a small child, I think like most people, um, he was my first really introduction to music of any sort of kind. Um, I didn't even know what music was before I saw him performing on the stage. I used to record his um, live performances. I played them back again and again and again so much so that I fucking ruined the VHS, VHS, VHS tape. Um, I'm such a big fan that when he decided to do his big tour during um, um, when he came, when he's meant to come to the O2 just before he passed away, I bought I think four tickets to go see him live at the O2, and unfortunately he passed away. Um, I found out that he passed away when I was in the Tesco's in Beckton with my little brother, and the news came through on a mobile phone, and it kind of spread through the entire supermarket, and everyone was super shocked that it happened, and it just really cut me up, man, when it, when he kind of passed away. And again, like I said, he was somebody that was incredibly influential. Um, to the way that I viewed um, pop stardom, the way I viewed art history, the way that I viewed just a celebration of music. And um, these allegations have kind of plagued him, plagued him throughout his time, even when he was successful, even when he passed away. 
And um, it seems like the two people, I think two of the people that kind of were fighting for his, were fighting in, in his defense are now coming against, are now kind of doubling back and saying that they actually lied in court or something along those kind of lines. And again, I don't know, for me, again, I just don't, I'm not sure how I feel about it. I think if there's evidence that there that he has done something, you know, he's passed now. I'm not sure what they can actually do. I'm not sure if this whole case in general is a is a if the long game is to hopefully sue the estate of Michael Jackson and try and get some money back that way in order to kind of um, use that as some sort of way to heal the pain. Whether it's kind of just a they want to let everyone know who that person was that is so important to us in history. Um, but again, I just, I'm just going to be honest, man. I just don't think I can separate this one. I think the R. Kelly thing, I was, you know, I, I'm okay not to play. I'm okay not to play R. Kelly song ever again. I don't, you know what I mean? It, we have enough people out there that you can replace R. Kelly with, but Michael Jackson really is a one in a lifetime talent. And I just think there's something about somebody not being able to stand for the, somebody not being able to defend themselves when they're not around that kind of rubbed me up the wrong way. And there's a part of me that's also kind of like, when I was a kid and that whole uh, Neverland thing was around and I remember being a kid and thinking, fuck, that'd be amazing to go to, right? And I remember once kind of saying to my mom, oh, I'd love to go to Neverland. And my mom kind of unequivocally kind of throwing a shoe at my head and telling me that's never going to happen. And, you know, that was understandable, right? I'm her son, right? I'm a small son under the age of 12, wherever, as if she's going to let me go and stay over um, the king of pop's house. But throughout that entire time of these rumors happening, that everyone was accusing Mike Jackson of being a, a pedo, being a creep, still these parents let their child um, stay over with a grown man, right? Let them sleep in his bedroom and have them sleep down the hallway. And it always rubbed me up the wrong way, right? It never really made any sense. Why would no? Why would? Why was nobody? Um, why was nobody questioning um, why these parents would do that? Obviously, now we've known, I think, since the years have transpired, I think two of the fathers from of the kids who were, quote-unquote, allegedly molested by um, uh, or sexually assaulted or exposed indecently to Michael Jackson have allegedly killed themselves. That's what I've kind of heard through the grave. And again, I haven't watched the documentary. I don't intend to watch it. Um, but you have to really question what the parents were doing, right? You have to, man. Like, this is something that no one really wants to speak about. Same with the R. Kelly sort of thing. There was watching a documentary. It's quite frustrating the amount, the level of naivety that happens when um, these parents or these young girls are exposed to somebody that they they deem as um, influential, they deem as a star, as an icon, and it kind of really bugs you, doesn't it? It really rubs it the wrong way. Like, what the fuck is going on? Why are people so um, susceptible to being duped when somebody has a bit of celebrity to their name or somebody is a star? right something that you'd never let a stranger like if a random dude came up to you um just imagine forget that imagine the scenario of you putting up a advertisement for a babysitter and i turn up what are you gonna say <laughs> imagine i turn up what are you gonna say exactly right you'd never let me look after your child never you wouldn't do it right so i don't know why these other people do it um again it's a king of pop maybe there's a different thing going on there but Personally, for me, I just don't think that's ever acceptable. That's ever a thing that should be happening. And again, man, I'm just, I'm just gutted and bummed out for everyone involved. I think for the most part, for those who have allegedly it has happened to, having to kind of suffer in silence, where everyone's not really believing your story. For the Michael Jackson estate, or Michael Jackson's family, having, you know, having his legacy, uh, you know, tarnished once again, uh, dragged through the mud once again. And just for everyone, all the fans all over the world are having to kind of, you know, really wrestle with the idea of um, potentially cancelling Michael Jackson. And it just sounds fucking nuts. Isn't it? It sounds fucking nuts. I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't want to watch the documentary. I'll probably have to. Um, I'm such a big fan. I'd want to see what the hell is going on. But again, our documentary is um, evidence enough to chastise somebody or counsel them. I'm not sure if they are. People need to see their day in court more so than uh, documentaries that essentially act as a, I don't know, man, the judge and the jury. But again, I don't know. Let's see what happens. Um, I think it's currently on HBO. Um, I'm pretty sure for the other, those of us in the UK, it will be available on most um, sites that you go and watch TV shows that you're not meant to watch. So probably find out on there somehow, somewhere soon. Um, what else is happening here? I think it's a bit glitchy, isn't it? Sorry about the little lag there. Um, 
lastly last but not least what else can we have here oh um have you guys um seen what's happened we are with de la soul de la soul now um the influential uh hip-hop group from the would you say 90s or the 80s i say 80s right de la soul. Was it 80s or 90s maybe early 90s um they went on sway in the morning and they kind of you know spoke about something that was super hard to kind of deal with where supposedly they signed a contract with Tommy Boy Records that um, allowed Tommy Boy Records to take 90% of their revenue of streaming and them to only keep 10%. And the whole logic behind it was that Tommy Boy Records or that particular record label was the only record label that was allowing them to make whatever they wanted to make, right? So they were, they were willing to take the um, harsher, the kind of the, um, the less favorable terms in order to kind of, really make the artistry that they wanted to make and again it goes to highlight just how scummy the record industry is and just how much of a um, opportunity there is for people to come in and really change it for the better um there's been a lot of talk out there about ownership and all that sort of stuff within the hip-hop community but i think with hip-hop being the number one genre with artists from hip-hop then going into other genres and using hip-hop as a way to springboard into other audiences i think there needs to be a real sit down between some of the big figures within the hip-hop industry to really kind of figure out a way that they can kind of go get around to owning right and to kind of being the owners of certain platforms certain streaming sites like what jay-z is doing with tidal distribution publishing in order to kind of really circumnavigate what these major record labels are doing because as as scummy and as inhumane as the record labels are they don't really have an object they don't really have an obligation to look out for the best interests of the artist i think my thinking in that will be the same way as in uh, Dana White, how he treats his UFC fighters, right? We all know Dana White is a bit of a bad dude, right? When it comes to UFC fighters, um, he's given them unfavorable terms. The UFC has signed a deal with Reebok that basically diminishes the amount of money that you fighters are earning. Fighters are not earning enough money to kind of really um, compensate the level of risk that they're taking in the ring, the sponsorship. There's a lot of issues that go around it, but it's not really up to Dana to kind of look out for the best interests of the fighters, right? So fighters' interests look out for themselves. So the talk of them unionizing kind of fell on deaf ears for the most part because there was too many people that were not willing to kind of risk their career in order for the long-term gain or health of their overall pockets or salary. Same goes for hip-hop, right? Um, these record labels are there to kind of essentially uh, prey off the weak, prey off the um, the vulnerable, prey off the people that are desperate, right? People that are coming into hip-hop, coming into music um, in dire circumstances who are wanting to kind of upgrade or change their life or in order to kind of you know i don't know uh have a better future for their family so it's no surprise that some of these artists would take big um cash advances right up front in order to take less percentages of their overall earnings at the back end whether it comes to publishing whether it comes to masters but i think nowadays since with the, the days since we have streaming in the streaming era with people listening to music more than they've ever listened to it in the past. I think, um, and obviously people getting paid for the amount of streams that they listen to. I think it's maybe more advantageous to have the rights to your masters in your back pocket. So if ever there came a time where you wanted to earn some money on the music that you did make, you can make it instantly. You don't have to really um, divvy up that many ways. But again, I think it, it, will, it will take, it, it takes everyone in the industry to come together and figure out a solution. Um, I don't think it takes people complaining about record labels and hoping that they change. That's not going to happen. 360 deals will always be around there. It's a good model for a company to make money, essentially to take a bit out of everything that you do, whether it's touring, merchandise, um, ticket sales, whatever it may be. But it's up to the people that are really pushing the culture forward, the ones that we we deem as forefathers, um, to really kind of uh, put a flag in the ground and say enough is enough and make a change for it. Because again, the De La Soul interview on Sway in the Morning is super sad, man. Like um, De La Soul, the group don't look like they're in good shape. They don't look like they're thriving and prospering. They're thriving and prospering. And considering how influential their music is, considering how influential um, their artistry was, uh, or still is to the younger generation coming up considering how important or how considering what that the soundtrack they provided for some people coming up i think it's it's 
it's sad that they're not being able to be compensated in the right way. And I'm just hoping now with the interview coming up and people really seeing the dark sides of the industry, people are kind of waking up and seeing, oh, we can't really live like this anymore. We can't have our, our favourite artist, um, you know, touring year in, year out in order to make any sort of income. That isn't the right way to go about things. Um, and it also kind of segues a little bit into the, the Kanye West story that's come out where supposedly he's fighting, um, I think in court against, I think he's suing EMI and Rockefeller Records to get his masters back and publishing. And he's trying to cite this um, this old law from California that essentially um, renders music contracts null and void or entertainment contracts after a seven year period. And um, part of the contract is because most of it has been redacted. You can't really see most of the details, but there's an interesting part that's come out that everyone's talking about where um, I think the contract that Kanye West signed it, it never t um, basically states that he can't retire. Um, he has to keep performing. <laughs> it's like a fucking, it's a, effectively it's a slave contract, right? And it's, you know, it's funny in the respect that um, Kanye West went up to TMZ and said, you know, slavery was a choice. Um, and obviously his contract is essentially a slave choice. But it's fucking insane, what is it? Somebody of Kanye's level, somebody of Kanye's stardom, someone of Kanye's level of influence has signed a contract that janky where he's basically under servitude for the rest of his life. He's not able to enjoy his riches and just relax someone on a beach in Cabo. He has to keep producing music in order to fulfill his contract. It's fucking insane. And again, a change needs to come. We need to see something happen. I'm not sure how it's going to happen, who's going to gather around and make the change, but I would like to see the hip-hop community come together and really fix it. Because again, it can be fixed. Somebody invented Spotify. Somebody invented iTunes. Someone can invent a new way of um, allowing artists to get their music out there it's in a record industry, as in a, in terms of record publishing or in terms of manufacturing of records in terms of marketing. Somebody can figure something out. We don't all need to go for the major label um, route. And again, major labels could die the same way that print industry could die in the same sort of way. Or they could offer another solution, right? Where if you wanted to go and get exposed to the radio and maybe have a different pool, they could act as it. But we need to have another option that exists. Maybe it's not the independent option because some people don't like, don't want to do that kind of level of work. But there is need to be something else in the middle that artists can sign up to, especially the younger ones that are coming up. But anyway, it's kind of depressing to be honest, you know, considering just how influential the, the soul are and seeing them sit down somewhere in the morning and talk about their struggles. But, you know, I guess um the one thing that you can say is that they're going to be a lesson for everyone coming up next, that you can't allow yourself to be put in such janky deals, especially in the streaming era. Anyway, um, that's it for now. Um, I've got to jet off. Thank you for tuning in for the Agus News English episode number 167. Super short one, I know. Allow me. I'm going to come back again on the other side of a regular episode. But until then, I'll see you guys again very soon. More info regarding more, check my website, AgusNewsInglish.com or DJ listing blogs on Zach Malaki on there. If you're watching on YouTube, give me a like, give me a subscribe. If you're on the podcast app, leave me a five-star review. Let your friends know. And I'll see you guys again tomorrow for another episode of the Agus News English Show. Peace.